Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Haddad. I'm the Senior Director of the Europe Center here at the Atlantic Council. I'm delighted to open the last and concluding panel of our uh, Central Europe Week in partnership with the Equilibrium Institute in Hungary, where we're going to talk about navigating geopolitical tensions, Russia, uh, China, with a great panel of experts. I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in to our second uh, annual Central uh, Europe Week, where we brought in experts from the private sector, from government, uh, from the think tank community to talk about the common challenges that the United States, Central Europe, and the transatlantic relationship uh, face. From Belarus and Russia to uh, promoting digital uh, innovation and shaping common norms and standards across uh, the Atlantic to economic recovery, resilience and COVID to, of course, energy security and uh, defense issues. Uh, Central Europe is core to the mission of the Europe Center and the Atlantic Council. And it's no coincidence that I'm actually speaking today uh, from Prague after spending a few days in Warsaw, where a delegation of the Atlantic Council uh, reasserted its support and solidarity with our Polish allies in the face of the aggression at the border by Belarus and, of course, by uh, Russia. I'd like to thank our partners, uh, Equilibrium Institute, GMF, Globesec for uh, these days of uh, conversation and thank the team at the Atlantic Council led by Denise Forstuber for the organization of this uh, these successful days of uh, conversation. And with this, let me turn it to Daniel Barsa of the Equilibrium Institute to moderate this final panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, for the introduction. And let me also uh, welcome you uh, at uh, the concluding uh, session of the Central Europe Week of the Atlantic Council. My name is Daniel Barta. I'm the Director for International Affairs at the Equilibrium Institute. And uh, uh, we are the co-organizers of today's panel discussion on navigating the next geopolitical challenges. Today, we will explore ge key geopolitical challenges uh, Central Europe is facing with uh, we will touch upon the potential impact that close ties to China may have on transatlantic relations, as well as the vulnerability of the region. We will uh, also discuss a range of, of, uh, of uh, issues uh, Central Europe is facing with from another stakeholder, Russia, including energy and national security. Obviously, we will touch very relevant current topics, such as the Belarus border crisis, the war in Ukraine, and the region's cooperation with the NATO and the United States on these issues. Uh, you can ask questions from our experts via uh, the Atlantic Council's uh, 2021 Central Europe Week page, or if you are following us on YouTube or Twitter uh, by commenting uh, under, under the video. Uh, let me welcome also warmly our speakers today, excellent uh, experts from both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Julia Friedlander uh, here with us uh, today, uh, C. Boyden Gray, Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the Geoeconomic Center of the Atlantic Council. Julia is an expert on sanctions policy and combating illicit finance. She served uh, uh, in the U.S. Treasury and CIA and as a senior analyst previously and worked for the White House between 2007 and 2019 as director for the European South Sea Europe and Economic Affairs at the National Security Council. Welcome, Julia. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We have Ms. Uh, Rachel Rizzo, uh, Senior Fellow of the Europe Center uh, of the Atlantic Council and adjunct Fellow at the Center for New American Security, uh, working in, on, in the Transatlantic Security Program. Uh, she focuses on European security, NATO, and transatlantic relations, and she also uh, began her career as a financial analyst at the Goldman Sachs. Uh, and uh, also, let me welcome Ambassador Jakub Wisniewski, who is the Secretary of the Board and Special Advisor to the President at the Globsec uh, in Bratislava. Uh, Dr. Wisniewski is a Polish, former Polish ambassador to OECD and former director of the Department for Foreign Policy Strategy at the Polish Ministry of for Foreign Affairs. In the ministry, he was responsible for, uh, for uh, planning and he was uh, drafting the Polish foreign policy priorities between 2012 and 16. And he also served as a speechwriter then uh, Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski. And finally, let me welcome my friend, uh, Dr. Andras Ratz, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Security and Defense Program of the German Council on Foreign Relations, DGAT, 
uh, Andras joined the Robert Boss Center uh, for Central and Eastern Europe, Russia and Central Asia in, in 2019. Previously, he worked as a senior fellow at uh, the Finnish Institute of International uh, Relations, and he is a non-resident research fellow at the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. He also served as a senior fellow at the Hungarian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, he is an expert on Russia's foreign security and defense policy. Andras, welcome. Uh, uh, welcome in the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today here. And let me turn to Rachel first, uh, asking a question on the strategic competition with China that is going to be more and more in the focus, central focus of the US foreign and defense policy. Uh, how do you see how, how uh, as this emphasis grows on, 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 uh, on China, how do you see how it is impacting European allies and how is it shaping the nature of the transatlantic relationship? Sure, Daniel. And first, I'd just like to say thank you to the Atlantic Council and the Equilibrium Institute for hosting this discussion at such a critical time in the transatlantic relationship. Um, and I think you framed this question correctly. Uh, strategic competition with China has indeed become a, if not the, central focus of U.S. foreign uh, and defense policy. President Biden is perhaps the most pro-EU and pro-NATO president that we've seen or perhaps will see for a very long time. Uh, he's made repairing the transatlantic relationship a key component of his administration and his picks for ambassadors uh, to, to, to various European countries and institutions go to show the depth of transatlantic expertise of the people in his inner circle. You have Julie Smith, who was finally confirmed last night as US ambassador to NATO, uh, Michael McFall and more. Uh, but I think when you look at the lens through which this administration views geopolitics and geostrategic competition, it is through the lens of China and the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, earlier this year, when you look at meetings, for example, that were on the White House calendar, it was China and Europe, China and Latin America. So you really see how China is a, a thread that, that goes through all of these topics. And I think we're also seeing in real time the influence of the Indo-Pacific crowd within the Biden administration. Just look at the, the deal, the AUKUS deal, which at this point everyone knows about or is at least somewhat familiar with. Uh, this was championed and pushed by the, this sort of Indo-Pacific crowd within this administration. And we all saw how that, um, that uh, affected the US relationship with not just France specifically, but the transatlantic relationship more broadly. And the reason for that is because I think it points to how this administration, and I think the United States in general, uh, views the relationship with Europe, which is that we have always been each other's most important partners. We always will be, uh, but our focus and attention is elsewhere, and it will be for the foreseeable uh, for the foreseeable future. Now, what this means for Europe is that we're now seeing this administration actively support calls for strategic autonomy. Now, I think it's important to be clear that this really isn't, there's not an agreed upon definition for what this is. It means different things to different people. But as the U.S. continues its pivot to the Indo-Pacific, I think we'll see much more support from the U.S. side, which hasn't always been the case historically for Europe to further integrate its defense capabilities in line with NATO in partnership with the United States and have an increased ability to take care of the security situation both within its borders and in its own neighborhood. Thank, thank you. you. You both mentioned um, the Indo-Pacific region as a key focus for the United States and the U.S. call on strategic autonomy for Europe. Uh, now the European Union uh, released its strategy uh, for increased en engagement in the in the Indo-Pacific region. Do you see an added value of, of a European presence, or you think that Europe should? only focus on its strategic autonomy as seemingly it is not capable at this point to handle its, its uh, conflicts, uh, its external border threats with Belarus, the, the Russian forces uh, at the Ukrainian border, the energy crisis. So is there an added value of a European presence in the Indo-Pacific region? Sure. I mean, I, I think that it can't be either or. It has to be both and. But I think that the Europe's periphery and its neighborhood should be its primary focus. I think, you know, when you look at how the Biden administration has framed the current geopolitical context, 
it is this broader struggle between authoritarianism and democracy, the idea that free democratic societies are what we have to fight for. And part of that is protecting aspects of the global community that allow for free societies to, to flourish. That includes things like partnership with allies and partners, standing up for, for human rights, protecting sea lines of communication, increased naval presence. And I think in that sense, the US and Europe are stronger together in the Indo-Pacific than we would be apart. And all of those issues are direct directly in line with the EU's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, at the same time, though, Europe has to ensure that it is focusing, I think, the majority of its attention on the security issues within its own neighborhood and within its, within its borders. You mentioned Russia. You mentioned a continuing COVID-19 pandemic. You know, I'm calling in from Berlin right now, and there's talk of another full lockdown coming. So we're seeing a fifth wave of COVID infections, uh, issues with energy security, uh, Belarus weaponizing migrants against uh, our, our Polish allies. So I think when it comes to Europe proper and Europe's back yard and periphery, that's where the United States will view Europe as being able to provide the greatest benefit as our ally and partner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Let me turn to, to Julia now. Um, uh, you, you, we are still discussing the, the, the Chinese threat uh, at, at this point uh, and then focus on, on, on that angle of, of the geopolitical challenges. Well, if, if we think about the history of, of Central Europe and the history of relations with China, the, the 17 plus one, 16 plus one format, we, we can see that the, that the Chinese firms can uh, be offer competitive and uh, anticipated to develop and through, through offerings uh, around the infrastructure, 5G infrastructure and digital connection. So uh, it's very, the temptation is high to to have close relationship with China and have trying to establish uh, close business relationship with China. Uh, what can the United States provide uh, to uh, to the European partners to, to provide a better alternative? What can the European partners and the United States for Central Europe provide for to become a better partner for Central Europe? Thank you, Daniel. Um, and you're not asking easy questions on a Friday. Um, I, I would I would start out by saying that this is actually in Central Europe week uh, at the Atlantic Council, but the problems that you're suggesting are not strictly Central European ones. Um, and I think that that's a good um, uh, a good context when in this conversation to say these countries are not the problem are, are not problem children in that sense because. After the, um, you know, during the course of the Eurozone crisis, the Troika um, imposed privatization requirements on many troubled countries uh, of Western Europe um, and who are experiencing similar questions of competitive bids from the Chinese on infrastructure and what are we going to do about them. Um, and to be frank, uh, when I, at, at the time I wrote a paper that said that um, you know China wasn't growing fast enough to uh, to meet the absorption capacity of Europe of of, of your uh, meet uh, European production capacity. So again, at the time, the, the 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 mood in the room was a lot different about who was weak and who was stronger. Um, I think that there are a couple of different things that um, that European countries can do in conjunction with the European Union, but I think a lot of it also has to do with uh, with efforts within the within the financial sector and financial market regulation. Um, the first um, the first is of, is of course investment protection, right? The CFIUS model that the U.S. has passed um, over the past couple of years through, through congressional legislation and EU member states are now all required to adopt some sort of version thereof. Um, the more transparent um, and procedural these things are um, and more developed the tools are, not playing political favorites, using um, uh, using it for certain protectionist measures or just to control certain industries, but really quite clearly delineating what counts as a national security element and what isn't will help um, preserve the sanctity of that tool and make it useful for uh, for the countries that have them. I think that it's uh, important to also say that not everything is a risk from China, right? I think that the, that was something that the US, as it ripped off this Band-Aid sort of um, pretended at the time and I think that when I was in the, when I was in the administration I was I was sort of given given the go ahead to say that every every dollar or coming or not dollar necessarily coming in from China was going to be a risk to somebody and that was myopic because of course the United States itself has uh, dependencies on China that um, in our certainly in our financial sector 
Um, what I think that is one of the major problems here is the alphabet soup of, um, of investors, right? From the European Investment Bank to the EBRD, um, to, who have focused elsewhere over the past, uh, past decade or so because of different rates of return. No one understands really what the contingencies are, what the lending practices are of these organizations. And so I think that they're sort of renew, renewing interest in the region as a competitive uh, a competitive market is and drawing the and drawing some sort of political goals into these organizations will be useful. Um, they are often driven by um, immediate return and and um, and um, and specific projects. And I think that there can be brought brought bring in some some more uh, centrality to focus there. Um, and then I think that there's it also has an issue uh, is an issue of um, financial capital market integration within the EU and the ability for banks to uh, to lend to infrastructure projects within the single market. And again, this is another post eurozone crisis sort of centralization reform and say, okay, we're going to do everything in the name of export promotion because that's what we need to do to recover. But in the in the process, um, restricted lending requirements to, that made it really hard to actually give credits to other eurozone members. Um, and that, and and, with, and hand in hand with it, with capital markets comes um, ESG and the ability for um, for companies to see uh, a lot of uh, potential in in renewables development, especially as the European Recovery Package uh, is put into place, and so much is earmarked for that. So um, I'll I'll start there. I'm happy to answer any more any more specifics. Thank you, thank you, and I'm sure there will be a number of questions uh, on, 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 on this angle and, and, and on China, but let me use this opportunity you being with us here today and, uh, and, uh, and you being a, a, an expert of, of sanction policy. During the week, uh, we've seen discussion covering the border crisis in, in, uh, with Belarus, and, uh, and it was uh, often mentioned that, that uh, the US and the U European Union would like to pose new sanctions on the Lukashenko regime uh, to push for change. Uh, seemingly, uh, it worked, but how much these sanctions are working against, uh, against uh, Belarus, against, uh, against uh, Russia? And uh, what are the ways uh, uh, the US and the allies can uh, do and how can they better prepare themselves to defend uh, these countries from, from such attacks? How can they use uh, these instruments against these countries? Sure. I mean, I would be the first to I, 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 maybe, I don't know the first, I just, I, I would like to underscore that I, I don't like the term hybrid attack for the use of um, the the abuse of innocent civilians for, um, uh, it sound, makes them sound a little bit more like a cyber attack, which, um, which it's certainly not. I think that what the, I'm, I'm not usually a fan of sanctions for sanctions sake. I'm, again, I come from the Treasury Department and I'm a little bit skeptical of political symbolism of, of financial restrictive measures that don't actually freeze assets. Um, and that's where um, where the United States, unfortunately, is um, is not as well equipped as the European Union might be, given what we might perceive to be the location of, the, of Lukashenko's assets or those around him. Um, but but in in this instance, I think that the, the power and the sort of ec the economies of scale of the European consensus have really made a big difference. Um, the ability for the European Union to react um, so rapidly and so and and so uh, so visibly too. I think that I saw a comment saying that the. And Brussels, Brussels bureaucracy and the fact that it takes a couple of days and everything and things get leaked actually sir, has a magnifying effect to show how the severity of the situation or how 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 much it's being debated. Um, so I do think that that has ultimately the ability to react quickly in this instance has um, has really made uh, made of a, made a bit of a difference. Um, is I mean it's, this is not going to um, this is not going to change the long term goals of a leader. Right, and I think that that's something we have to come, we have to reckon with. But there are regional opportunities to play some of these guys off of each other, um, and to see that this is not a this is not a this is not Europe versus um, Europe versus Russia and, and Russia and Ukraine with Turkey sometimes playing a supporting role. These countries all have. Um, 
their own web of financial and economic interdependencies. Um, you know, I I would say that um, you know that that Erdogan perhaps thought that he had, was playing a making himself con- conveniently irreplaceable and useful um, by stopping flights, Turkish Air, Airways flights. Um, but you know, he's the he's of course the famous purchaser of S four hundreds, but also a seller of drones to Ukraine after uh, the, to keep industry alive after the F thirty five program miraculously ended. So for for, for Turkey, so I think that that um, there are uh, options there to, to to say that okay, the lines are not clearly drawn, you know, on the outside of NATO, right? Yes, the famous Turkish drones. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, and and let me turn now to to uh, Jakub and continue with this topic because this time, as Julia said, we might react it quick enough. Um, but but as Julia pointed out. Uh, intentions of these leaders won't change much. Uh, so could you also offer some recommendation how the US and allies can better prepare and defend these countries, defend Poland and Baltic countries against such attacks in the future? What, what can we do better? What, how can we prepare better? Mm-hmm. Uh, greetings from Bratislava. Before I answer your question, I want to say that um, if I were a Polish uh, nationalist uh, uh, ruling the country, I would be talking constantly about defending uh, European borders and about hybrid attack as if it was, uh, I don't know, bloodthirsty vampires uh, in the hundreds of thousands. No, these are people needing assistance and uh, if uh, Poland claims to be a Christian country uh, practicing Christian values, the human life would be of utmost importance, no matter that they are being uh, instrumentalized by the uh, rogue state of, uh, of, uh, of Belarus. Uh, secondly, if I were a dictator of uh, Belarus or, or Russia, I would uh, be waiting for exactly the very opportunity that uh, has happened, meaning that uh, you have a European Union and NATO member state which is in trouble, uh, in conflict, uh, in, in, in constant spats uh, with its uh, members, uh, uh, partner member countries. Uh, uh, rule of law issues uh, with the European Union, constant uh, Europe bashing, which is a typical uh, uh, message from the Polish uh, politicians uh, uh, ruling from the ruling coalition, also from the, uh, the public broadcaster. This is the, the situation. So uh, basically, uh, uh, when we talk about recommendations, uh, we should uh, have uh, uh, the leaders in Central Europe rethink their policies. Uh, uh, are we as Poland or Hungary the West, or are we somewhere in between, or are we moving closer to uh, Russia and Belarus in terms of standards of how we rule the country, how we uh, um, uh, create the balance between the judiciary, the executive, uh, uh, and uh, and, and other branches of government. So this is uh, probably the the, the fundament. Uh, The recommendation would be to restore the unity in the West uh, by making Polish uh, uh, and Hungarian also uh, politicians realize that uh, uh, standing alone, they cannot achieve much, and the 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 conflicts, the problems, the provocations coming from the East will be uh, more numerous uh, if uh, these countries are estranged from uh, from, from NATO, from the European Union. Of course, there are other uh, little things here and there, short term, that uh, the West could be doing, and uh, it's about gradation of uh, escalation of sanctions. Uh, let us uh, remember that this is not the end of the world. This is not even 2015. The numbers are just a couple of thousands of people uh, in the eastern border, so probably we should wait before we uh, fire our bazookas uh, of uh, even fa- far-reaching sanctions, before we uh, close uh, borders for trucks before uh, we, uh, some some important steps have already been taken there is more that can could be expected we could uh, deal with airline companies who rent out uh, planes to the belarusian government and they could be blacklisted uh, uh, some belarusian exports especially petrochemical products uh, could be banned etc so there is a lot uh, of uh, of um, of uh, measures that we have uh, in our uh, at our disposal 
proposal, but uh, uh, we should pr proceed carefully and not to take the uh, baby out of the bath, uh, uh, simply be re realistic what we can achieve. Um, and um, uh, to make a long story short, what matters is the internationalization of the whole conflict, something that the Polish government have been, has been very reluctant to do. Uh, uh, in a way, uh, Polish uh, government people have started to believe in their own propaganda that uh, Poland does not need anybody, does not help, does not need help. Only recently there have been a request for some attention of NATO, but still up to today, there was no request, request for uh, some assistance from Frontex and other EU institutions, which is uh, very telling about the intentions of the government. We also need uh, um, additional pair of eyes, so to say, in the, uh, in the form of the media, in the form of uh, NGOs, which would help to, uh, to protect uh, citizens in need. But for that, we need a change of heart uh, within the Polish government. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, before, before uh, ask, asking a follow-up question from you, let me remind the audience that uh, you can ask questions from our experts uh, in, in the panel by uh, uh, sending it uh, through the dedicated page of the Atlantic Council, uh, the Atlantic Council Central Europe Week uh, page uh, in a question box, or by commenting on a Twitter or YouTube uh, channel. Um, so Jakub, you, you mentioned the internal issues, the, the rule of law problems, the democracy, but there is another ang angle uh, that uh, we have not touched yet. That's, Certain Central European countries uh, tend to have closer relationship with the uh, with China and uh, Russia than others, uh, whether on the basis of political reasons or or, or, or hope for for increased trade and investment ties. Um, how do you think these closer relationship impact bilateral relations with the United States and the European Union as well? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, some countries. Uh, in Central Eastern Europe are trying to be smart in terms of uh, eating the cake and ha having it as well, uh, which means uh, a sort of playing the, uh, uh, on many instruments. Uh, and uh, sometimes the, the, the governments are naive in thinking that they can utilize uh, uh, utilize um, uh, Chinese money or, or, or Russian influence uh, as a leverage with uh, uh, partners in the West. Uh, I don't think that uh, this could work. I don't think also that uh, many initiatives coming from these countries have uh, reached their successful conclusion. We see that the format 17 plus one has rather floundered. There have not been a massive investments. There have not, there hasn't been any modernization coming from China. So there is no credible uh, alternative to the West. Uh, at the same time, uh, some of these countries do flirt with, uh, with uh, uh, Chinese and uh, Russian narratives. Uh, there has been disinformation coming from this country and it has come to the very receptive grounds in, uh, in, in some parts uh, of Central Eastern Europe. Sometimes it's even the governments, uh, like the Hungarian one, who has um, uh, adopted uh, some of the messages as its own, uh, showing that uh, uh, despite uh, the fact that uh, Hungary is a member of European Union or, or NATO, um, uh, the, the, the Chinese uh, partner is a very promising one and uh, uh, simply we need us to strike a sort of a balance. I would expect that America and the West in general uh, draws a, a very uh, a thick line and shows that uh, you cannot be a simply credible ally with uh, making compromise on the other side for example, buying technologies from China uh, or adopting uh, Russian uh, messages, either directly or indirectly. And we know, we, we at Globsec, we have studied it thoroughly. We know that this uh, Russian uh, television, uh, Russian messages, Russian uh, um, um, ideology is creeping into the mainstream of the public space in, in many Central Eastern European countries because of the fact that 
these are fresh uh, recent uh, democracies because that uh, public uh, um, opinion is kind of confused about uh, the uh, democratic standards about how the democracy should be working and it's very dangerous so where we would expect the west is to simply show that uh, some things are uh, some lines should not be crossed and we should uh, keep a unity uh, on our side uh, otherwise we will be ruled and divided by uh, partners who have no scruples who act uh, in a, a very aggressive manner thank you thank you very much Eku. Andras, uh, uh, let, let me turn to you now. Um, you, you have authored a number of studies on, on, on hybrid threats and hybrid warfare. And, um, and uh, uh, we've seen a great deal of them perpetrated against uh, and against Central European allies. Um, how do you think uh, these Central European countries uh, can elevate their independent capacities uh, to address the cyber and hybrid threats posed by Russia and other countries, and uh, what measures you would suggest uh, to be integrated into the national uh, security and defense planning? Uh, also, how do you, would you evaluate uh, the state of transatlantic relation when it comes to, to, to cybersecurity or, 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 or uh, facing hybrid threats? Very easy and short questions, thank you. Hashtag no. Um, Actually, yes. I mean, um, I also heard a number of, of pieces about about hybrid threats. And a few uh, months ago, I actually read one of my early pieces about hybrid threats from 2014 or 2015. And it's astonishing to see how much I was wrong um, and how much we misunderstood the nature of threats back then. And I fully support what, what, what Julia said, that it's not actually, speaking about hybrid threats is not the best term we have. But still, this is a term we probably need to use because this is what all decision makers understand. So even from the if, even if from the academic perspective, it's not necessarily the best term we have. We still need to use it because because that's the one that that is used to to, to shape our thoughts. Um, the good news about resilience to hybrid hybrid and cyber threats. The good news is that historical perspective helps. We've been way more resilient. We are way more resilient right now than, than we have been, let's say, seven years ago. Remember when the Crimea happened. Remember when the Donbas started in Ukraine. There was a lot of, I mean, a lot of dark spots and lack of knowledge about what exactly was going on. Right now, we understand the threat a lot better than we did. The bad news that understanding enough, of course, is not enough for resilience. So concrete action is, uh, is also needed. When it comes to the nature of hybrid threats, it's useful to separate the military and non-military ones, even though the adversary employs usually both in a parallel way. So non-military tools are supported by military pressure and vice versa. Still, again, from the constructivist perspective, it's useful to separate the two. When it comes to military threats, military pressure, again, our situation is a lot better than it was seven years ago, particularly in the Nordic Baltic region, NATO's enhanced forward presence is something that Russia is, uh, I mean, the, the tripwire logic helps a lot against Russia. This, this is something we did not have in 2014, 2015. Now we have it, we know how to operate it. We understand a lot more how the Russians think about it. And also important, Russians perfectly understand that NATO presence in the Baltic states pose no actual military threat to them. So that's also important to understand the logic of, uh, of the adversary. But when it comes, however, to the non-military dimension of hybrid threats, including cyber, the picture is much more, much more bleak here. This is, I think, where, where the core weaknesses are in the non-military sector. Uh, and if I would need to make short recommendations, I mean, the first thing, the most important, I would write in all the capital letters, corruption, combating corruption. Corruption among the elites, because it still constitutes a massive vulnerability, particularly in countries of, uh, of Central and Eastern Europe. We may name strategic investments, we may name shady loans, we may name high, highly intransparent energy contracts, including intermediaries in them. And we unfortunately need to name also the so-called revolving door type of corruption. Namely that the official has a mandate, fulfills his or her mandate, 
but thereafter takes up a job, takes up a job, let's say, in, in Russia's Rosneft. And there are several examples for that in, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. So we really need to step up uh, against corruption. Yuli already mentioned uh, the, the need to act in the financial sector and in, in, in the field of investment protection. However, uh, here I see also another sector or field where the US could do a lot more than it does actually, and this is exposure. Because various US organs have the, all the information necessary for exposing corrupted political decision makers about the fact of the corruption, about the location of the assets, a lot of things. There is a lot of plenty of room for closer EU-US cooperation on that. And how exactly exposure is done, it's a, it's a question of secondary importance, I think. So the uh, last thing, cyber, defense against cyber. If one studies how cyber attacks are actually conducted, I mean, when a penetration actually takes place, in most cases, it's still a human error. Human error, either directly somebody responds to a spear, fish, a spear phishing email or human error in the sense that we just don't invest enough in the good enough in the, uh, technology. Carelessness, lack of knowledge, all these things. And here, particularly regarding Russia and China, but mostly China, I think it would be critically important to apply all the pressure necessary to make sure that no central European country opts for Chinese-made 5G networks. Because once these networks get installed, once China gets into these sectors, due to the interconnected nature of our systems, due to the interconnected nature of how EU and NATO information is, is flowing among the member states, a vulnerable one is a vulnerability to all. And this is something we really need to keep in mind. And, and personally, I think it would be crucially important to refrain from using Chinese-made 5G, 5G technology. This is, of course, in the very end, a national decision but there is a lot of room also for the transatlantic community to help the countries take the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Andras. Let's briefly uh, also discuss a little bit about direct military threats. Um, as uh, uh, currently uh, related to the Belarus crisis, a number of experts and officials uh, raised attention on Russia's military buildup uh, uh, and the increased presence in the Ukrainian border zone. Uh, posing another challenge uh, to the region's uh, security. First of all, how do you think, how serious uh, this threat currently is? And uh, are we doing enough to, to, to defend Ukraine or help Ukraine defend itself? I noticed the term briefly in the beginning of your question, so I do my best. Um, when it come, I, I always get the question like, is there a danger of a war between Russia and Ukraine? Here it's important to clarify that they call it the war has been going on for seven years. This war between Russia and Ukraine, regardless of whether Russia admits its participation or not, this war has already been longer than the Second World War. So actually the right question is whether there is a danger of a major escalation compared to the low intensity conflict that we have in, uh, in Eastern Ukraine. When it comes to the troop concentration, troop concentration alone is not that new. I mean, in fact, Russian Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, ordered already in 2016 to set up two new divisions relatively close to, to the Ukrainian border. The, the third motor rifle division to be set up in Baluiki, that's Belgorod Oblast, and the 144 motor rifle division to be set up in Yanya, that's basically the Smolensk region. So the setup of these divisions have been going on already for a while. Still not completed. Part of the troop movements that we see right now belong simply to the setup of these very divisions. So alone, the troop concentration should not be a source of concern. The problem is somewhere else. The problem is, or pr probably the problem is, uh, that there are public remarks from US officials and also officials from other countries, which keep, st uh, keep stressing the danger of possibly upcoming escalation. Simply the troop movements would not justify that, or at least the troop movements that are publicly known. But nevertheless, the warnings are still there. So my assumption here that probably the ones who issue the warnings know a lot more about the troop movements and also about the adversary's intentions than could be reconstructed from, uh, from public sources. We know a few things uh, that may, may, be a, may be a reason for some optimism, at least in the short run. 
in the short run, meaning one to two months, an immediate escalation is highly unlikely. Why? Because right now there is in Russia there is a period called Rasputitsa. That's a Russian word meaning then, then the roads disappear. November, early December is the period of heavy rains. That unpaved roads and fields become just unpassable by, by vehicles and mechanized units and tanks and everything. However, once the ground freezes from late December, early January on, large-scale operations again become possible. If you only look at the history of the war in Ukraine, all the two largest battles, both the two largest battles, Ilovaisk, it took place in uh, the beginning of uh, in August, uh, September 2014, the Baltsava, January, February 2015. So before and after this Rasputitsa period that we have right now. And also a remark here from an analyst, dear colleagues, we have been wrong so many times about Russia's intentions in Ukraine. With other words, Russians managed to outplay us, outsmart us so many times, particularly in 2014, 15, 16, that we should, I think, be really careful about sound statements that there is no danger of an escalation of the war. Two, two days ago, there was an article in Foreign Policy, which firmly stated that there is no danger of an escalation. I would not be that, uh, that sure in, in this assessment. So my recommendation here is, is that a lot more modesty is, is required because we have been wrong so many times. Last question, are we doing enough? According to whom, right? In the very end, in case an escalation takes place, it will be Ukraine that has to fight. But this Ukrainian army is much different from the Ukrainian army of 2014. If Russia decides to escalate, sure, Moscow can do it. But the surely would not be an easy victory. Even the land bridge scenario, which is voiced so often, so from Eastern Ukraine, Russia moves and connects the territories to the Crimea. Dear colleagues, there's a major city on the road, Mariupol. That's half a million people. I mean, taking a city of half a million, it would not be easy even for Russia. I mean, urban warfare is the bloodiest of war types. So if an escalation takes place, it will surely not be easy for Russia either. My point here that what we are doing the transatlantic community, so equipping and strengthening the U Ukraine's own ability to fight, that's a very good direction. But we also need to do a lot more in the non-military sector. Ukraine is facing a major energy crisis coming in a few weeks. Russia stopped selling electricity, Russia stopped selling coal. From the 18th of November, Belarus is also going to st stop selling coal to Ukraine. So Ukraine is going to face a very hard winter, which might make the life of the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian people a lot more difficult, even if there is no military escalation on the Eastern Front. I hope this is an answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe to follow up this last statement about the, the energy the crisis coming up in Ukraine, um, I would have a question, and I don't know if you would like to take it or if, if there is somebody else to take that. We've been investing in Central Europe so much on reverse flow, also providing energy security for Ukraine. Now that we have experiencing an energy crisis as well, are we capable to help Ukraine in, 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 in such a scenario? Are we capable to, to provide uh, gas uh, Ukraine for Ukraine if it's needed? Or, uh, or uh, currently uh, the energy crisis is so deep that we would be not capable to do that. I don't know who would like to take this one. Uh, maybe, maybe I will direct back to Andras then. Uh, Thank you, but I mean, personally, my, my knowledge is not enough to, 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 to judge this question, so I would rather pass it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, then seemingly if nobody wants to take this question, I we have questions from the crowd, uh, as we have uh, our, our viewers as well, and I would encourage everybody, uh, if, if, you, if you would like to ask questions from our panelists, uh, then, then uh, send it through uh, the website or by commenting on uh, the Twitter account and uh, YouTube. Um, so we have a question on, on, uh, on European security and what Europe can do. Uh, we are seeing a move from the European Union to develop an EU lead re a rapid reaction force, which would be separate uh, from a NATO response force and the very high readiness joint uh, task force. Uh, to what extent this step is the right direction in elevating Europe's independent capacity? And do you think uh, 
this is, uh, once again, a risk of a potential duplication, despite previous statements uh, from, from leaders uh, of, of Europe uh, that indicated otherwise, that Europe won't uh, create duplications. Maybe this is a question for Iaku. Yes, I, I want to say that <clears throat> I applaud all of these activities uh, uh, leading to a strong uh, common security and defense policy. Um, there is a degree of skepticism in me because uh, throughout my all my um, career, I've been hearing about progress and usually this progress has been very uneventful and very bureaucratic, uh, uh, which always makes me sort of skeptical whether uh, I, I live my life to see uh, the, the such a uh, rapid uh, military force uh, born and uh, this would uh, be a really deployable and active and uh, and movable uh, in a crisis like the one that we are having now on the polish belarusian border for example uh, so uh, the verdict is still out um, i don't want to go back maniacally to to the political situation in poland but just to give you a taste of uh, how things stand in my home country. Uh, yesterday, there was a visit uh, of a commissioner um, who happens to be uh, Belgian. And uh, this uh, Belgian, uh, Belgian politician was uh, uh, received by the Minister of Justice of Poland. Uh, um, and uh, uh, he was, uh, as a memory gift, uh, he was given a, a map uh, or a, a photograph of, uh, of war so uh, after the Second World War, uh, with uh, Warsaw in ruins, and the message was that uh, before European Union has any conditions as regards the rule of uh, uh, rule of law uh, in Poland, uh, countries that have led to the Second World War should pay the price and contributions and whatnot. And also there was an additional uh, message from uh, for the Twitter of a uh, uh, deputy minister who said that uh, Belgium is not in the position to preach about uh, democracy and, and the rule of law because it's just 200 years old, whereas a Polish statehood goes back a thousand years. Uh, we could laugh uh, uh, that this is just a funny statement, but this is a typical uh, message uh, coming from the Polish government officials these days. And of course, this is directed mostly at uh, electorate in the country, at the domestic audience. But people in the West, in the Western Europe, can read, uh, can translate. There is a Google Translator, and uh, these messages are rather clear. So that brings me to the very sad, uh, bitter conclusion that we can invent all these wonderful instruments of European solidarity, but uh, if we, as member states, uh, uh, do not believe uh, in the benefits of Europe, and actually we are looking for every opportunity to undermine it, there, there will never be a progress. So the, the, the progress we should be looking for less in the formal instruments and policies, but more uh, in the attitudes of our political class. Thank, thank you, Jakub. Uh, let me turn to, to Rachel as well. Uh, uh, how, how do you see uh, this development on the other side of the Atlantic? Is this the development towards the strategic autonomy the United States is, is, uh, is looking for, or this is not yet that much? Well, I think here in the United States, um, you can be forgiven for being a little bit tired of the discussion surrounding strategic autonomy because it's gone in circles for decades at this point, especially over the last five years. Um, I remember writing a piece in 2017 about the support for strategic autonomy, and it seems like today I could just change around some dates and a couple references, and it would still uh, largely remain true. Um, and so, but, but I do think with this specific administration, we are seeing more outward support for Europe to further integrate its defense capabilities. When it comes to things like um, strategic airlift and air-to-air and -air refueling, I mean, these, these are conversations about what Europeans can actually do in order to um, take part in operations within their neighborhood that have historically relied on the defense and support of the United States. I think we should also 
I, I'm I'm very skeptical of the the term duplication because it seems like it's used a lot of the time, but the the reference and the definition I think is unclear. Um, but I think we do need to look at um, things that are already in place uh, that the European Union could use to their advantage. I mean, look at the Berlin Plus Agreement, which was agreed upon in 2003, where the EU can basically re uh, request NATO makes uh, assets available, assets and capabilities available to the EU for an EU-led directed operation. I mean, that hasn't really ever been, been, been tested in, in real life. So I think that now is the time to have the conversation about more uh, defense integration and defense responsibilities on behalf of the EU, but let's also make sure that we're looking at the what we already have available, the frameworks we already have av available for use. Thank you. Thank you, Clear. Uh, we, we also received another question uh, on, on a topic that we have not touched upon yet, and uh, that is extremely important uh, following the, uh, the Glasgow Climate Summit, and it's the issue of, of uh, climate. Uh, and I will turn to, to Julia to answer uh, this, this question. Um, we deal a lot with the climate crisis. This is at the top of the EU agenda right now. It seems it's going to be a very important on the US agenda as well. Uh, and uh, we both highlight in both sides of the Atlantic that we should coordinate with the emitters uh, such as China. Uh, how do you see, is, is there any conflict between uh, reconciling the emphasis for strategic competition with China by day and uh, talking about cooperation with China uh, on environmental protection by night. So, so is, it, is it possible to, uh, to cooperate on this issue, this major issue, which is a threat for both for China and, and, and for us? I think that there probably is, maybe not right away. And I think that that this, you know, if you look at the at this at the meeting between um, Biden and Xi this past week, a, an attempt to put, um, you know, I guess some of the some of the uh, White House officials termed it guardrails on the relationship and understanding where um, where what the rules of the road for engagement are going to be. Um, I am personally a little bit skeptical of the the framing um, um, the framing of. U.S. economic resilience as a competitive element vis-a-vis -vis China and saying that we're going to rebuild U.S. bridges and roads because we're competing with China um, and that's resilience. I think that that's setting ourselves up for a bit of a rhetorical, um, a, a bit of a rhetorical crossroads when we again have to go and say, let's all understand what our long-term strategic interest is um, on the climate question. I don't think it's, I certainly don't think it's impossible, but I think we, we have to choose um, we have to choose words very carefully because at the same time as we're going, we're trying to um, lay lay rules of the road for uh, fair trade practices and improving defensive instruments, whether it's on the U.S. side or I actually think some of the more innovative thinking is happening in the EU right now um, in that in that regard that um, that that the framing of those questions is going to be very important. Um, I do think it's I do think it's possible to coordinate with China. Um, and I think a lot of it might also have to do with pressure, not from um, not from the sort of creators of the of the UN concept, right? I think that there's a perception that that COP26 it is a it is um, it, it it's it's attempting to be global, but it really is in, in Western image. And I think that there's feedback also from um, regional partners, regional regional partners in developing countries that are are recipients of Chinese aid, or in um, and and even from from the Russians for that matter, who understand what melting permafrost means to them. So I think that it's where where we're a little bit of a ways away, but I think that um, within the next, say, five five years or so, we're going to know better about how that works. Thank you very much. We received a question on on uh, on uh, deterrence, and uh, the question is: Russian aggression continues to be a challenge to Central Europe and the broader region. Not only in recent buildup in Ukraine, but uh, threats from Russian missile systems combined with continued you know, cyber and hyper across Europe. 
NATO leaders and ministers have agreed that allies won't necessarily match Russia missile for missile and instead plan to pursue a mix of political and economic measures. What role do you think Europe can play here in setting up a credible deterrent mix uh, beyond standard military measures? So what could be the alternative instead of missiles? Um, maybe this is a question for Andras. Thank you. Another easy one, right? Uh, when it comes to, to the Russian missile threat, if we look at it strict from the military perspective, there is not much way that Europe alone could withstand or counter such a threat. We don't really have the technology necessary for that. Plus, Russians have much bigger numbers. But when it comes to non-military means, meaning sanctions, meaning other measures, Russia is still massively dependent on Europe when it comes to energy export, when it comes to trade, when it comes even to technology. So I think that the right strategy is not to, to aim at the moment when missiles are already flying. We need to be proactive, we need to prevent that. And because of, and thanks to the transatlantic alliance, Russians understand perfectly well that once missiles start flying towards Europe, missiles will start flying towards Russia as well. And I really don't think that the Kremlin would be up for an all-out war. And it's highly unlikely that an all-out war uh, could be in the very end won by Russia in such a way that actually Russia remains what we, what we, uh, what we know it is. So my, my point here, most of the Russian missile, missile programs, including the so-called Wunderwaffe, these, uh, these magic weapons Putin understands, uh, the hypersonic missile, the nuclear torpedo, all these. The intention behind is not necessarily to, to outpower and outgun the West. It's more to counterbalance the West. I mean, in many technological fields, Russia is lagging seriously behind the West, also in the field in, in terms of resources. Yeah, sure, there is a difference in purchasing power parity, but still. So most of these super weapons, Moscow seems to, to produce and, uh, and further develop not with the willingness to blow Europe off the map, but to counterbalance the pressure it perceives from the West. Paradoxically enough, I think in the long run, with these super weapons on, on, on I mean, quotation marks, super weapons on the Russian side and various Western technologies on the other side, we might actually re reach again a Cold War type balance, mutually assured destruction, just with a bit more advanced systems. So that's, that's my, my short answer to that. Europe alone couldn't really stand against this threat. That's, uh, that's one more reason why transatlantic cooperation is crucially important. Thank you. Thank can you I also much. add one, can I add one quick thing? Sure. I, would, I, I wanted to add on to that because I, I think when it comes to non-military deterrence, cohesion is deterrence. Putin wants a fractured Europe. He wants a fractured NATO, a fractured transatlantic relationship. So when NATO was looking at, for example, drafting a new strategic concept that is going to be rolled out in Madrid mid next year, deepening consultations amongst allies is going to be a key part of that strategic concept to ensure that fractures and fissures that might happen bilaterally, um, that might happen between uh, allies not out of 30 for 30 basis, um, don't bubble up and create issues at the North Atlantic Council level or at the level of um, uh, ambassadors and, and state diplomats. So I, I do think that when it comes to non-military uh, deterrence, um, a cohesiveness between the transatlantic allies is gonna continue to be uh, one of, if not the most important uh, things that we can focus on. Thank you. Let me have a, a final, Final question uh, for all of you, uh, because uh, cohesion and coherence, that's I think very important as well. Um, and obviously uh, there is a format where uh, Central Europe could uh, potentially cooperate and that's the Three Cs Initiative. How do you see uh, the potential of the Three Cs Initiative as an instrument to increase uh, Central Europe's uh, capability uh, and uh, and readiness uh, to face with these uh, threats, uh, both from China and Russia. Do you think it could
could be the right instrument, or the right way to cooperate with the United States, and what should be the key spheres for cooperation under the three C's initiatives for the Central European states. Maybe starting with... Uh, let me yeah. just say very quickly that I'm not a believer in the Free Seas Initiative. I don't see, I don't understand the rationale behind it. I know intentions of some people who stand behind it, who, who see it as a counterweight uh, against the European Union, against the German Ger, Franco-German motor of the EU. I don't think that America uh, can uh, help much uh, uh, as regards the socio-economic development of the region. So to make a long story short, this is up to the EU to, to, to foster modernization in the spirit that uh, probably you have in mind. Thank you. Andras? Just a short, slightly more optimistic remark. I think the Three Seas, Three Seas Initiative is one of the few cases when we can have investments and development projects which are of high security importance, but also very beneficial to the public. In other words, it's easier to win public support for infrastructural projects, let's say interconnecting highways, north-south uh, north highways, throughout Eastern Europe, better railway lines, high-speed trains, all these things. Once, by developing these things, the life of our everyday citizens becomes a lot easier. Cross-border cooperation, business, tourism, all these things. And by the way, it's also very useful for moving our troops should that become necessary. So actually the, the possibility of a synergy between, I mean, a development project, which has benefits both for the civilian and for the militaries, it's a, it's, a, it's a really important opportunity we should take. And yes, it will not solve all our problems, but it will hopefully increase our resilience. Thank you. Julia, do you have some comments on this? No, just quickly, I, I agree um, with, with uh, what Andras and Jakub just said. I, I think that it has um, certain uh, certain structural limitations that rely a little bit on the, the nature of US leadership and the tone coming out of Washington. And while there could be, um, uh, there, there, so there could be hang, hang ups there. And I, my, my one concern, although there, you know, technical capacity building and making the links between the public and private sector and potential, um, uh, potential investors is good. Uh, I, I, what my concern is, I think that some, some, some member states might see that as much as more reliable than the instruments that the EU might provide. And that might be a mistake. Thank you. Finally, Richard, do you see US is still committed uh, towards the three C's? I do, and I think I think uh, Julia laid out pretty much exactly what I would say. So I I, I will leave it at that. I think my colleagues uh, uh, covered that issue pretty well. Thank you. In this case, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. I would like to thank our panelists, Julia Friedlander, Rachel Rizzo, Jakub Wisniewski, and Andrea Strauss for joining us here today. And on behalf of the Atlantic Council of the United States and the Equilibrium Institute, thank you very much for joining today's panel. And I wish you a nice weekend and hope that you join the future events of both the Equilibrium Institute and the Atlantic Council of the United States. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you.